Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Cricket Weekly Podcast. England's twos and threes beat Pakistan ones, three nil, an extraordinary team-wide performance across the series to give the clearest indication yet of England's absurd white ball depth. We'll be talking about that, the England women's series against India, the end of the county championship group stage, the worsening COVID situation in the county game. We'll be previewing the latest Wisdom Cricket Monthly, the hundred and more. I'm Yaz Rana, and to get through all of that with me today this morning is former England batsman Mark Butcher, the magazine editor of Wisdom Cricket Monthly, Joe Harmon, and Quick Viz analyst Ben Jones. So England three, Pakistan nil, the big sporting news of the week. Joe, England blew Pakistan away in the first game, beat them hands- handsomely at Lords before chasing 331 in the finale. We knew England had great depth, but th- at this level... Yeah, it was good fun, that, wasn't yeah. it? Best thing that could have happened, given that everyone came out okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think when I looked at that squad, I thought, you know, they'll give Pakistan a, a good go, but if they're going to win the series, Ben Stokes is going to really have to pull something out of the bag here. As it was, he was the only top five batter not to score a half century, <laughs> the only bowler not to take a wicket, by far the most expensive bowler. Um, all that said, he, he seemed to captain them brilliantly, obviously got his got his players playing for him. Um but I thought the most impressive thing was just everyone did something, kind of aside from Stokes in terms mm. of his, his individual contributions. Uh, I mean, I thought Phil Salt at the top of the order, it's easy to say, go out and play your shots, but to actually do it in the way that he did uh, was pretty astonishing. The way he went after Shane Hafridi was <laughs> just fantastic to watch. Um, but all through that side, I mean, it was great to watch Parkinson actually have a chance to to just bowl and bowl at some kind of times that allowed him to to try out what he wanted to do. Saqib Mahmood, obviously the star of the show. And then Lewis Gregory, and, and I think we're going to come on to uh, to Ben's favourite, who who kind of won it in that third game where that was the one, wasn't it? To, to chase down that score with that little experience in your side was an astonishing effort, really. Mm. I thought it was a, quite a big series for the pod as well. A few players that we've been hyping up for quite a long time doing well. <laughs> when you hype up enough good. players, they're going to come <laughs> good, aren't they? <laughs> Yeah, blind squirrels and nuts. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was a it was a phenomenal performance, as Joe was saying, kind of across the board. Who who kind of uh, caught the eye for you more than anyone else? Um, well, I mean Parkinson and Shakib, I think the two Lancashire boys, um, at Shakib, sorry, were were superb. Um, Phil Salt just doing doing what we've seen him do for for Sussex. I think highlighting the fact that uh, we've spoken about the fact that he seems to have gone up a notch in from um, the last couple of seasons um, in terms of just in terms of kind of like the the pure aggression that he's playing with now I think before it was a little bit I'm going to go out there and have a dip and see how I get on now the the intention is to go out there and stamp yourself on the opposition and be and be brutal about it and it's been, that was been great to watch um, Bryden Cast the pace there I mean it, it doesn't seem to do a great deal with the ball beyond bowl it quickly but that's uh, that <laughs> in some often quarters enough. that's often <laughs> enough um, the, the whole thing was really pretty spectacular. Um, I, the one thing that it highlighted for me, however, was you know, you know, taking nothing away from the performance of England and winning 3-0 against Pakistan is a sensational effort for, for the first team, let alone the second, um, is just how much these, you know, the, the, the circumstances upon which touring teams are, are having to play are starting to, to really be a problem um you know Sri Lanka are not a great side anyway but again you know they, they they had their issues throughout the throughout the trip um the standard of play I thought in the first lot of lockdown in 2020 was astonishing and I and I frankly couldn't believe how all of the teams from everywhere managed to sort of keep up the standard to that extent but I think we're now starting to see the effects of what's happened in the last however long um, on on touring teams in particular, and it's Got, becoming more and more difficult for them to kind of to get performances out of themselves. Is that, is that mental fatigue, lack of warm-up? All games? of it, all of it, everything. It's all it all combines to create um, huge difficulty in being able to. Um, I mean, just get up for it, let alone sort of be prepared enough to go out and play against a you know against a, a, a country. England, where everybody is playing cricket at the moment, everything is, is as normal as it could possibly be, and everything for touring teams is as abnormal as can possibly be. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, maybe maybe that's a pattern that we're going to see recreated throughout the rest of the summer. I mean, you know, fingers crossed, the India trip goes ahead, the hundred, all the rest of it. But so, I'm um, just a word for for sort of Pakistan to say, okay, well, I, I kind of I can understand. It's pretty embarrassing, really, to lose to a second string side, but there are also a lot of mitigating circumstances there. 
just going to say that the fielding performance from Pakistan in that final ODI was, was about, about, as, about as bad as I've seen from a professional mm. side for a very long time. Uh, I don't know whether that feeds into the kind of the, the mental aspect, the lack of concentration. I mean, they're not a great fielding side anyway. You look through that side, they're, they're kind of well behind the curveball in terms of the uh, what other sides are doing in the field. But still, it's pretty... Mm. pretty rubbish stuff really and you could see their heads just dropped and it was yeah it's hard to how much of that is due to bubbles and how much of that is just a side that are losing a series but it was pretty tough to watch at times I saw a few people um, kind of Pakistan fans and journalists talking about the impact of the decision to let I think Steve Rickson the, the, the field, former fielding coach um, a few years ago he was in the Pakistan setup and they were, they were fantastic in the field they, for a long time. They were really good. And then he was let go and the fielding has gone downhill ever since. And I think they're in the last two and a half years, I think, since the start of 2019, they dropped more catches than anyone in the world. They're, they're dropping one in four. You can't be you can't succeed in international cricket if you're doing that. Mm. You need to have that base level of quality. Fielding's a little bit overrated maybe in terms of its actual impact. But if you're dropping that many catches, mm. it's going to take its toll. And yeah, impact that was the bowlers the, as well. Well, exactly. Yeah. And the, the mental fatigue that, that takes on, you know, you've got to create 25% more chances mm. than ideally you'd, you would do. But no, it was, a, it was a shame to see it kind of end like that because as I thought the quality of the play itself was actually quite high across the series given the players that were involved, particularly on the English side. But actually, that that was an obvious area where it was like this is this is a bit ropey now. This doesn't mm. this doesn't look good. Pakistan should be better than this. Mm. Uh, on on Phil Salt, who you mentioned earlier, I thought one thing that was amazing was you got a failure in the first game, first game in international cricket, and in the second game, he lose a couple of early wickets, mm. and he still has a go. That was, I thought that was incredible. Yeah, I mean, again, that's a testament to the way that that England want to play. It'd be a testament to the way that Ben Stokes said, "Hey, listen, guys, you, you've got an opportunity here that perhaps might not have come." Um, your way and in the case of a lot of those players who knows when they will we'll get the, uh, the the pale blues on again in the future um, but listen no recriminations and I think that's that's a, a huge part of England's white ball cricket and it's sort of filtered down hasn't it through to to the, the county game no recriminations you go out and you've been picked to play this way just go and do it and if you walk back in having slogged it straight up in the air no one's going to no one's going to tear a strip off you for it because that's why you're playing. Um, and, and, you know, under those circumstances, given that, given that scope, players are able to go out there and freely be themselves. Um, and that, hence the, the performances you've seen. And, and again, we can, we can perhaps lay too much credit at the door of people who aren't there in, in Morgan and the, and the, uh, and the, the all-round um, vibe of, the, of playing for England in white ball cricket. Um, so let's not take anything away from the performances of guys who, who must have felt it. You know, you, you kind of, out of nothing, you're, you're suddenly playing for England in front of packed houses, um, something that would have been a dream forever. And, and for some who thought they might get there eventually, but were a long way off, don't underestimate the nerves under which you're playing there, you know, mm. the pressure that you're putting yourself under. So it's hats off to all of them for, for coming out and being able to play at that sort of level. Which actually reminded me, uh, obviously, a completely different style of cricket, but what you were saying about New Zealand's test side, uh, a few weeks ago on the pod that that is such a kind of well-oiled machine that knows exactly how they should play that when sides come into the side they know exactly what their role is how they should play and we saw that in that Phil Salt becomes Roy Stroke Bairstow Parkinson kind of fills the job that Rashi would do Bryden Cast not dissimilar to the role that Plunkett played in that World Cup winning side and you just see these are roles that you can fit into yeah. um, and I agree I don't think we should give Morgan too much credit for something he wasn't there for but Ben Stokes has been right at the heart of that yeah. World Cup I mean I, I'm not saying we shouldn't give him any credit at all I'm yeah. just saying you know but don't don't forget to shine the spotlight on the people who actually Absolutely. went out there and did it um, but, you're, but you're right I mean so England, England's sort of scouting process, if you can call it that, or, or the reason why, say, Sam Hain maybe didn't get a gig from um, uh, from uh, from Warwickshire, given his amazing fifth white ball numbers, where they were looking for, for certain types of player to play in, in certain types of positions. So they weren't looking around to see the people who had the best numbers. They were looking at the people who would do exactly as you describe, you know. We need, we need an enforcer. We need a quick bowler to come in and bowl in the middle overs and maybe take a few wickets there. We need a leg spinner to replace mm. Rashid. These are roles that work for us. We know exactly what we, what, what we need from them and they will help the whole um, perform in the way that, uh, that our first team would do. And that's exactly what they did. And it, it's, it's bit, when you're as clear-eyed as that in terms of looking for players, it makes finding the right guy so much easier, you know, as opposed to just, you know, what, what's that old, that old football saying? Um, about you know round pegs in square holes or square hole, square square pegs in round holes, 
don't do that. You know, if you do that, you, you find yourself having to make up, make up, um, make up space or make up uh, certain amounts of certain, certain wicket taking ability, certain run making ability, certain strike rate ability in other areas, but pressure on people um, having to do other, somebody else's job for them. Whereas if you have people who come in just to do the exact job that they're already prescribed for, you don't have that issue. It's also self-perpetuating as well, isn't it? Because when a team plays in the way that England played, it's a very distinctive style. And everyone knows that that's the kind of player England want to pick. The guys in county cricket who are trying to make a case for selection will adopt that style and they will push. Phil Salt, as you say, has been doing this for Sussex for years and he's been doing it in the overseas leagues as well in T20 cricket. That means that you create this environment where you're not having to hope that the next generation is good because they know that they've got to work in a particular direction. They've got to play a particular brand of cricket. Otherwise, they're not going to get selected. I would also say as well, I think that England have seemed to be winning an awful lot of white ball games and still getting quite a lot of criticism in terms of their little bits of select, their selection choices in terms of, yeah, not picking Sam Hain, the designated county sacred cow for this week. And it, it does, it, it grates with me because I think that we don't want to give Morgan too much credit. We don't want to give Andrew Strauss too much credit. We don't want to give that coaching staff, you know, over the top amounts of, of credit. Because guess what? They're not the guys in the middle hitting the ball, running at Shaheen Afridi. Uh, but the point is, is that you create an environment which people can come in and fill salts, you know, mouthing off at, the Sh- at Shaheen Afridi because he's just throwing the ball for five, for, for five overthrows. That just speaks to an environment where players can come in, play in a particular style, be confident and aggressive and express themselves. They're all cliches, but they're cliches because that's what England believe in. They say them a lot because it's the kind of the guiding narrative of them. Question on Saqib. Saqib was obviously brilliant. Nine wickets, which is the joint most ever taken by an Englishman in a home three-match ODI series. Whoa, they're just, there they're just out of the week. That's the good stuff. Um, we've been saying for a while that maybe he's one player who possibly could have got more opportunities the last couple of years. He's only two years younger than Tom Curran. Tom Curran's played 45 more matches for England. Um, he's particularly impressive with the new ball. But England have a lot of new ball options in ODI cricket. Wokes, Archer, first choice, but David Williams, Sam Curran were very impressive against Sri Lanka, for example. If he does get into that England first choice ODI team, what do you think his role would be? I think, well, the vacancy is that middle middle overs role, isn't it? The guy who can come in and do the Plunkett role. They've still not really replaced Plunkett. Um, and that speaks to the quality of, of Plunkett himself. I think what, what Mahmood has managed to do recently, I think, is develop a few more tricks. So it's not just run in, hope that it reverses, keep pitching it up, keep putting it in the slot, and eventually one goes and gets a nice kind of Twitter-ready wicket with all the stumps being clattered. I think what's better for him now is that he can he seems to be able to bowl those slower balls, a few more cutters. Maybe, I don't know who he's picked them up from, but he seems to have developed as a lot as a bowler. I know England are, are recognising that. So I think he's going to be groomed for that middle over, middle overs role. Because, you know, that, like you say, Chris Wokes is a phenomenon in ODI cricket. You're not going to take the new ball away from him. And they are struggling in that particular area. What I, what I hope more importantly um, is that he's moved definitively ahead of Tom Curran in the T20 setup. And we'll see that in the week, in, you know, in the three matches to come. But what the skills that he's showing are the skill, good, enough, good enough the to skills succeed that, in T20 The problem cricket. with that is the skills that he's showing are for a completely different role, which kind of go <laughs> which are for, well, for, new, just, for, I, new, I for taking the new ball. I, dis- I disagree because <laughs> I think that, yeah, he, he, he was pitching it up and swinging the new ball and he's, he doesn't need to do that in the T20 side. But England do need someone who can bowl. They, know, they do need full, someone. Full and, but full and straight at the death, which is what he can do. Yeah. He can do that, and he did that in the PSL before yeah. that was planned earlier this year. But, his, but, his, but, the, but the eye-catching stuff from him was at, the, was at the top of the innings with the white ball and we're talking about, you know, square pegs round holes and all of a sudden you're saying well we'd put him in the middle middle overs role which is not the role that he does it's not what he does yeah, <clears> there's no way he's been picked to do it's a, fa- it's, a, it's a fair point but I think that this is specifically with T20 cricket I'm, I'm moving towards now I, I, I think that the, the raw skills that he's shown in T20 cricket can be adapted more easily than maybe as you say in, in ODI cricket maybe you do need to be a bit more you know specific roles for specific players round holes round pegs etc mm-hmm. but I do think in, in T20 cricket he has got all the skills you need to succeed bowling throughout the innings and I still think there's a spot in there pushing, so, Chris, pushing Chris Jordan pushing TC I think that I, I really do think he's, he's the coming man and there's momentum behind him we also can't be sure about Joffre Archer's fitness going to the T20 World Cup he's had yeah. a series of injury problems over a long period of time and he is I mean, he's the best T20 fast bowler in the world, in my, in my view. So, but we just have—we can't just assume that he's going to be there. And seeing Saki bowl in the way that he did is is hugely positive as someone who can't step in and be as good as Archer, but he doesn't necessarily have to be that big a drop off, which was would have been a concern um, kind of before Mahmood's emergence. I mm. think. Um, my moment of the week, by the way, is the Parkinson delivery to a man. Got oh, to talk yeah. about that. My word, what a ball! 
Uh, the biggest spinning delivery take a wicket in ODI cricket, is that right? Is that I think biz? so. Ball tracking. Ball, ball yeah, tracking, right, obviously. Yeah, so 2006 yeah. onwards, when history began. Yes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it was it was amazing, wasn't it? It was, it was one brilliant. of those things, to, in, in a little insight into our horrible little nerdy little world, we were very, we looked at it and like, well, that's ragged, you know, 12 degrees of spin or whatever. And they were like, I wonder if that's the, the, the biggest spinning delivery he's ever taken a wicket with. And you're like, oh, it is. And, it's like, and then, what about an English player? Okay. All of a sudden, we just keep kept winding it, and yeah. then it was like, "Oh wow, this is the yeah. most spin we've ever seen for a wicket in well, I, I thought it was brilliant because he's he's produced a couple of balls like that in county cricket this year. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I find it very frustrating when analysis just focuses on on his speed um, because he turns it more than anyone else and gets it to drift more than anyone else, which which I think are noteworthy. Um, and also, he he had four catches dropped off his bowling this series. If they were taken, he ends up the series with nine, which is the same as Mahmood. Um, and also, his record in ODI cricket. Yes, small sample size. It's identical economy rate to Rashid since the World Cup um, at a slightly better average as well. I think I thought he had a quietly good series. And when he did get hit in the third game when Rizwan and Baba really got in, um, I don't think that really was because of his speed. I think he just got his line wrong. Um, so I thought that was a very, very... Yeah, it's, it's easy when, when a player... I think, it's, I think it's reasonable to bring up the speed because he is the slowest bowler yeah. in the world. So you, you can't get away from that. But I do think it means that when he fails or you know, comparatively fails, it's too easy to just lean on and say, oh, it's because of that. Because it's it's such an obvious thing about his game. But I do, mm. you know, he's he's a fantastic young bowler. And when Rashid came into into the ODI team after the 20, 20 year 15 World Cup, he took wickets, but he got whacked for ages. It took a while for him to become the guy who takes wickets and doesn't get whacked. And I think sometimes because Rashid's so good, people expect Parkinson to come in and be like a, a, essentially the same bowler but slightly worse it's, that's not how it works for leg spinners they're weird you need to you need to see him develop over, over the coming years I, I think he's got a, a lot to offer this England side I think the slowness is actually an advantage in white ball cricket anyway I, I a, really do argument, I, yeah. <laughs> you know it, it's different in it's different in um, long form cricket when you when you're the person that has to remove the batsman but when the batsman is trying to trying to score um, and and has a has a rate to go at, then the slowness is not massive issue. I mean, and the key the key really is that he's just much more accurate now than he was two or three years mm. ago. And and again, you know, the the best leg spinner I ever faced was was brilliant. Not because not because he had millions of variations, but because he was tremendously accurate. He could land the ball where he wanted to land it. Um, and Parkinson now looks like he's in that sort of in that sort of um, stage of his career where he's got total control of where he wants to land the ball, and that is the essence of it. Yeah, I think he'll really come into things for the T20 World Cup in Australia, slightly bigger boundaries. Um, I think it'd be very hard to, to get away there. Um, Joe, before we get into get into uh, Ben's moment of the week, Lewis Gregory had an incredible series. Um, and Aston on commentary uh, described him as a, as a very effective cricketer. And he's quite an easy player to write off because he bowled 78, 79 miles per hour, uh, doesn't bowl from great height. His batting isn't particularly eye-catching. But... Uh, both with the ball, but particularly with the bat. His innings in the final game was was extraordinary. Yeah, I would say particularly with the bat. I still look at him as a bowler and think he is going to go the distance against mm. high quality international batting lineups. Um, I know he bowled some. He bowled really nicely with a new ball. A couple of lovely deliveries in there, but it 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 looks it looks like good county level to me rather than international level. With the bat, he absolutely smashes it, and it was great. So I mean, basically. Pakistan bowled terribly at him in that third ODI just kept dropping short and he just kept weird it was, bowling, it was odd it would look like a plan and bowling pace at him it's yeah like, it, it, seemed, it, it seemed no very it was really really strange but the way he just kept taking it on I mean it's, it goes back to all the things we've just been talking about is yeah. that classic England and ODI side and actually you think when he got out when he skied one you thought actually that's not a great shot and England Probably, I don't know what Winviz said, which was certainly very topical in the, uh, the, the, the Sky Sports commentary box. Key does not fancy it, does he? Is it? Yeah, I, I, I've, been, I've, been, I've been having a few quiet words on WhatsApp with him, but it doesn't, doesn't seem to be sticking. But, but uh, at that point, I think Pakistan probably became favourites again, or, or, or maybe yeah. it was a 50-50 game at that point. Yeah. Certainly reduced it back to something yeah. close. Mm. Um, but you know, at, at that stage, there was always that risk, but he was prepared to take it on. And that, mm. that's the way he's played in county cricket. There's certainly a lot to like about him. I th- still think when England have all their best players available, I can't see him <laughs> pushing his way into a first choice side in the way that I can, so like even mood, uh, or even potentially in time, Phil Salt, if, if Royal Bairstow fall away. Mm. Uh, but that's not to say he's not a brilliant cricketer who in many other eras would have been a, a kind of a, a shoe in for an England side. Yeah, I think he's, oh. he's, he is. Okay, direct, again, we make a direct comparison with somebody who, who plays on a regular basis and that player for me is Sam Curran is Lewis Gregory 
a better bet? Or, or is Lewis Gregory, if they're both fit and both available, likely to get the nod ahead of Sam Curran? And I would say no. I mean, Sam Curran has already proven with mm. bat and with ball. Um, Rightly you know, what, so. Or like, so should he be? Or no, I don't. I don't think he should. I, I've, I've kind of always, I've always been a huge admirer of Lewis Gregory. Always, I think he's a terrific cricketer. But I'm, I'm just not convinced that he's quite good enough. Yeah. Uh, uh, either thing. Um, but he's a terrific guy to have as a backup. Should some of the uh, the all rounders in front of him not be not be available or not be fit, and, and I don't think there's any disgrace in that. I, I, I was really glad he showed what he's capable with the bat because in an England shirt up until that point he's only really batted seven in T Twenty cricket, which is pretty much the hardest job going, and it didn't go great. So um, to see him perform like that, I thought was 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 really good to see. Uh, ben, I mean, put it put it this way. Yeah. Do you see MS Dhoni? Bidding for for Lewis Gregory to play for Chennai Super Kings and then saying why don't you open the batting for us and open the bowling? Can you see I, that happening? I, I have you not ever see that at happening? Any point said that Lewis Gregory should be no no no. But Sanford. I'm not I'm not just I'm not I'm, I'm not saying you are. I'm just throwing it out there that there is there's your comparison. Yeah, I think right. I think there's actually something quite telling about the word that you use to describe him being. I know I'm very bluntly. He's a good cricketer. It's a phrase that you don't really use about Ben Stokes. You don't say, oh, Ben Stokes, he's a, he's a great cricketer. You say, oh, he's got brilliant with the bat, brilliant with the ball. It's the whole package with Gregory that he yeah. kind of just does a bit of everything really well. Yeah. And as a result, he's going to have a long, unproductive career. He'll play overseas leagues as well. I mean, he's he's fantastic T20 hitter. I, I mean, you know, groomed at Taunton on those on those pitches at that ground. He can go over to the leagues and he really whacks pace, particularly. Mm. He's like a kind of budget Chris Lynn. <laughs> so, like, he's going to have a lovely old career. But, yeah, I think I think Joe's right. When England are back to full strength, it's it's quite a way off the first team. What's your moment of the week, Ben? James Vince making an international century, which is a lovely sentence to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I love I love Vince. I have for many years, and I've got a weird kind of obsession with his 83 at Brisbane. And you know, greatest and, what and if in British one of the history. great yeah. what if moments. Uh, you know, if, if he goes to 100, doesn't try and take a single on, on Lion's arm, England probably win that five nil. I'd say <laughs> um, prove me prove me wrong. Um, but genuinely, I, I think that he's a player who... I don't think he's been badly treated by England. I think he's been given a good amount of chances. I think maybe he, he, he could have been backed a little bit more at particular times. I think he was dropped in at the start of the 2018 summer at a slightly inopportune moment um, when Ed Smith came in. But, you know, I don't think he, he's, he's not he's not one of those guys who you're kind of berating the ECB for treating him badly. But he's an incredibly talented player who's played for a long time in county cricket and looks beautiful, has been scoring runs in county cricket for a long time for Hampshire, um, and has just never quite cut it internationally. And I, I never thought that he would make an international 100 because it's James Vince and he comes in, makes beautiful 30s. So the fact that he comes in and actually doesn't just make 100, but makes 100, which wins England the game, from a position where they were completely out of it, it's the most unvinced thing in the world. Yeah, he did and get out with about 30 to win, though. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah it was that almost, that it would was, have been the most yeah. vinced thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> if England go and lose the game. Huh? But yeah, just like the spirit of him. But, you know, yeah. but like, I thought, actually, in a way, it was almost like, yeah, no, he's, he'd done his job, and he got the chance to walk off and kind of raise it back. Yeah. And he looked so happy yeah. when he got it. And I've I, never seen him express that kind no. of emotion before. Fair enough, he hasn't got an international 100 yeah. before, so that's not as well. But where, where, Ben, where do you think that leaves him? Is it just a kind of almost go. like a glorious sign off to a career that could have been something? Or is this I know, I know where he thinks it leaves him. He's <laughs> he's got him batting at three in the ashes. That's what that he's made that oh, leap from again. he's made that leap from that to that. That's nah, what's coming I, here. I, I thought it was Bang him in the armchair at number four below. Root. <laughs> I genuinely thought it was a bit like uh, Moeen's knock at Chennai. Like when he hit that quick fourth, it was kind of like a glorious farewell yeah, to the yeah, sunset. Yes. Yeah. Well, what I, what I would say is I don't, I, I'm, I'm certainly not taking any of his, uh, I'm not advancing his Red Bull credentials off the back of that. It's not, it, was, it was not that game. That pitch was an absolute motorway. You know, people, <laughs> people made runs on that pitch, you know, in, a, in an easy manner. But I do, I do think that hopefully what it's done, even if he never plays for England again, is it, it's just taken a little bit of the gloss of off the idea that he's kind of some meme player or some kind of silly, oh, you know, James Vince, what a rubbish batsman. Just the fact that he can just, even if it is, you know, glorious finale, walks off into the sunset, raising his bat as England win. I think that's, it's just, that's nice. It just, it just takes the edge off his reputation as mm. something of a bottler because he's, because he's far better than that. Personally, I'd, I, I would, I, I wouldn't take seeing him in the England test side, but I've been saying that for a while. That's not changed off the back of this week. I think he's a better batsman than some of the guys who England have given chances in the last 18 months, two years. I, I don't think that's with that. You know what? I don't think it's such a daft idea having given it a millisecond's thought anyway. <laughs> I mean, look, it, we'll, we'll find out what happens. Um, you again, just convinced again, yourself there, did you? No, 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 no. Convince, haha. Um, the, the, the cav- with the caveat, of course, that the, the India series might not happen at all. Well, but if, but if the, if the top three continue to, to, um, to, to underwhelm 
um, in this, you know, in these five test matches against India, saying they go ahead, um, then you know the case the case for for Milan, Test hundred at, at Perth, Vince eighty three at Brisbane, um, you know some experienced players who might actually be able to also not not just soak up some pressure but put some back on Australia starts to become quite loud. So look, he's done himself no end of harm. It's great, you know, great for him, great for all his his many supporters. I know there are lots of contrarians around the country who think he's the greatest thing that's ever happened. <laughs> Just me and John uh, Hotton. Well, no, no, there's a few more than you guys actually. <laughs> Sorry for um, that. And, yeah. But I, you know, I've never thought he couldn't play. That is for sure. Yeah. And you know, maybe it's done. Maybe it might have done something to convince him that he actually that he really belongs. Because I've never, I've never had. He he never carried himself with the conviction of somebody that kind of like was burning with rage that he'd been unjustly treated and that he should be in the England side. He was always kind of just a little bit sort of shrugging my shoulders and if it happens, it happens. Yeah. Yeah, well no, exactly. And I think and I think you need you need that. You actually need to have that kind of that a little bit of that burning arsehole bleep bleep that out, um, in you to kind of to survive in that arena, particularly if you're somebody that's considered on the outside. Um, as being a tiny bit flaky or a little bit soft or whatever the, the descriptions are used for, for James Vince. So I hope it has done. I hope it's lit a little bit of a fire underneath him and he's kind of thinking to himself, you know, well, I actually bloody deserve to be there. I've scored a gazillion runs and I'm bloody good and get me on that plane. Do you want to hear what he said after the game? Go on, what did he say? I had a bit of a shift of mindset, realising that I wasn't maybe high up in the pecking order. So now I'm delighted that I had another opportunity. I don't know when the next one will be, or if there will be another one, but I'm just going to enjoy this. I will never forget that day today. I'm going to cry again. All right, well, that's, see, that's not what I, that's not exactly. That's <laughs> not what you wanted, is it? That's not what I wanted. the most diffident <laughs> sentence. There you go. I mean, but see, but there you go. That kind of sums up what I'm talking about, you know, and perhaps that's, perhaps, you know, you have to look at all kinds of reasons as to why um, selectors or captains or whatever don't go into bat for certain players but do go into bat for others um, and you know maybe maybe it's James Vince's kind of shrug of the shoulders thing that has, has left that has made it easier for him to be left out than some other people who knows I mean there, there are lots of things that make up a cricketer yeah. and a cricketer that that finds himself being backed over 25 test matches or whatever because if he had if he'd played that many in the trot guaranteed he would have scored some runs but so goes, that's you know. So please don't that. say that in an interview, James. So go. No, there you go. I, I told you, you bastards. Pick me again. <laughs> I always, I did always have a lot of time for him. my frustration. Really centres around that World Cup where he had a real yeah. opportunity with Roy out of the game, and that was such a key position for England. We knew what their openers did, and he just didn't didn't use it, and he which, played a which bit. Which is exactly what I'm talking about. That's exactly it. You kind of you get that opportunity in the in the shop window like that. And it kind of, he just might as well not have been there. Mm. And that's, again, that reinforces the, the sort of the idea, perhaps on the inside, I can't speak for him, but it certainly crossed my mind when I was watching it. You know, oh, mate, you know, just you needed to be more. You needed to kind of, to, to instead of instead of looking like a, a mouse as you walked out there, you needed to grow in that situation and it shrunk him. And it showed even more when Roy came back into the side and England grew by kind of 30%. There, there you go. Because he just so, I mean, so there you go. So, so this could... And, and I've got his biggest fan over here. This could have been the moment or could still be the moment whereby he feels like he's grown and he kind of goes out there and owns the place. But judging by, the, <laughs> judging yeah. by his comments, that's not happened at all. He isn't, yeah. he, he isn't the first and he won't be the last guy who is incredibly talented and maybe doesn't quite prove it in international cricket for whatever reason. And you mm. know what? That's fine. Yeah. He can be a cult hero who everyone loved when he played and that's it. Just one thing on what you said earlier. I do think he was, it was slightly harsh when he was left out of Ed Smith's first squad because he got... Yeah. Uh, a 70 odd in his last test uh, in New, New Zealand, Zealand yeah. and then he got a massive double hundred in the county championship just before the squad was announced and he's never he's not played a test since then and also we've talked about this before on the on the pod when batsmen who are dropped from the England team then go back into county cricket and don't produce the goods then it must be quite hard to get yourself up for yeah. up, up for up for that having you know been dropped potentially harshly especially um, if you're not one of those people as Butch says with that kind yeah. of internal yeah. fire there you go I mean exactly. that's it again isn't it yeah what what the only reason that the, the the thing that the selectors are looking out for more than anything else when you get dropped again is your reaction. Mm. Is your reaction to sort of sulk and not make any runs, or is it hundred, hundred and fifty? I'll show you, you bastards. Is it that? And if they don't get the second reaction, then you're gone. I can't think of anyone, any player like that. <laughs> um, uh, we've got, we've got, we've got a question from from the Runout blog. Uh, one word answers, please, from all three of you. Um, has anyone from the ODI team this week? Without any pressure, well, basically, 
The run-out blog asks, uh, has anyone from the ODI team this week put any pressure onto anyone in the main team? Not necessarily players in the first 11, but in terms of squad. So one name from each of you, please. Um, I think they're I think they're already being considered anyway, but Parkinson, Saqib, that's it really. Yeah. Saqib and Tom Curran being the one who's under threat. Ditto, yeah. So keeps done. Yeah, uh, quickly on, on Pakistan, obviously a very, very di- disappointing series for them. Um, what what kind of annoyed me was that I know they had the two collapses in the first two games, but in the final games, how slowly they started. Um, the power plays are the easiest part of the game to bat in and they were 68 after 18 overs, 35 from the power play after only losing one wicket. England scored 84 despite losing two. I kind of think we're against a team like England. Um, scoring 330 as they did, you still you're still going to lose that game quite often. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? When when that, that phase was was happening, and when Baba was taking a long time to get off the off the mark, and they just they just weren't kicking on when the the scoring opportunities were there. If it's normal England, if it's Bairstow and Roy and everyone, then you go, oh, well, this is obviously going to cost them a game because it's, it's an absolute road and you could get 330 and England will chase it down. You could make 350 and England will chase it down. What was the surprise was that England's B slash C team could also do that. I think that was what I thought, you know, they're going to, they're just going to make slightly too many here, even with the slow start. But it, mm. it's, it, it was a concern because it's, you know, it's an old fashioned style of cricket, but that can be successful. It's just that on that pitch, it really, you know, you just needed to go hard from ball one. I mean, Bumble was on commentary, like within the first over was like, this is an absolute road. <laughs> and if and if Bumble's doing that from the, you know, from the commentary box, they're, if they're in the middle and they can't clock that. <laughs> Do you know what, as well, I, I, I refrained from, from posting it because it would have been a shit post par excellence, but... I was I was going to say something like something about the sort of well it, you only get good games if they're low scoring right you know that's the that's the parlance but unfortunately it only matters if they're close right yes <laughs> I mean that's, this is the thing it, you know lots of runs and close that beats not that's very many runs and close if, as far as I'm concerned <laughs> absolutely um, but um, so it, it was a hell of a game hell of a finish um, but you're right I mean Pakistan. And you would have thought they'd have learned their lesson from the tour a couple of years back, you know, when the same thing happened at Trent Bridge. Oh, actually, no, they won the game at Trent Bridge, didn't they? But there, there was there were two other occasions when they when Baba went out, and made a hundred, and it wasn't enough. They didn't get, they didn't mm. go hard enough. They didn't score enough runs. I think well, Bristol was the one, wasn't it? Yeah. Where it was like they looked, they they sailing off into the distance, and then England just did it, spinning. Yeah, on kept the game with five overs to go yeah. or something. Yeah. Stupid. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, moving on, England ended up winning the multi-format series against India, ten six. Losing, well, uh, winning the first and third T20s of that series. Um, welcome return to the runs for Danny Wyatt. She was averaging 14 in her last 24 T20s going into the Chelmsford game where she hit 89 not out to seal the series. Um, but to get the game of the series is probably the second one where England collapsed in a heap in the run chase in part of a very weird run out. What, what did you make of that? <laughs> what the game at Hove? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, England were absolutely cruising that game. And the two things happened in that in the over. Um, Tammy Beaumont got given out. Ian Blackwell gave her out LBW. And she kind of danced down the pitch and swept, and the ball would have kind of clipped the corner. You know, the, the corner of um, leg stump. It was kind of a, a tough call, really, um, a wrong call that was proven right. If you see what I mean. Um, and then, of course, you get the, the the bizarre ricochet where the bowler kind of dives and tries to stop the ball. It hits her on the boot, goes underneath her body, hits the stumps, and Heather Knight is kind of has no idea where the ball has gone. And the bowler's body is in between her and the crease, but there was no, you know, there was no willful intent to kind of impede. And that's her. crucial in in the law. Uh, the the yeah. law says and, that. And also, had the thing the problem for Heather was not where the bowler's body was because she could have easily reached over and just put a bat on the ground, but she mm. just couldn't see the ball. Mm. So that was the, the main issue. There was there was no obstruction there whatsoever, um, and it was well, just to keep a, it in the law. Uh, in, in the law is is intention. Yeah, and, and the, it, there was, was it was a none. bit of it was it was bad luck. Yeah, um, and uh, and and on that, you know, on that on those two things happening in and over a run chase that was still you know was still only sixes or just above sixes or whatever England stuffed up in royal fashion, mm. um, kind of giving you a little bit of a you know making you think a little bit that. Um, Given, given p- trying to knock Australia off their perch, having them got the sort of depth or even the, the belief in their depth to kind of go out and knock them off their perch, mm. given a similar thing. But I, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and say, 
you know, the, they lost three wickets in that run chase. One of Siva run out after a wicket keeping fumble, um, and then those two in and over, um, which constituted misfortune rather than uh, rather than a choke. Um, and then the lower order couldn't get them over the line against some, you know, very very slow bowling with with lots of lots of fielders in the right place. Mm. Uh, Harman Precor had a good game as captain, and that was that. But the, for the rest of the time, I think ten six didn't it didn't flatter um, it didn't flatter England to win by ten six, and they were definitely good for it. Um, and India, to their eternal credit, given the the length of the tour and the way that the games came thick and fast. Um, left with quite a lot of credit themselves, you know, mm. areas that they can certainly improve on and work on. But um, I think the fact that they pushed England to the very last game was a, was a credit to them. I thought what was what was really impressive about White's innings was actually what was was it, was exactly that actually the the way she uh, attacked the really slow bowlers. Mm. Um, she was brilliant at, far, at kind of attacking the, the the offside boundary, creating room for herself. And I almost wonder like if she'd benefit from a demotion in the order. I think she struggled a little bit against the the, the moving board, but she was so dominant against the slow bowlers yeah. in a way that England's middle order have kind of struggled against a little bit. And I kind of almost think if you swap Jones and White in the order, I think it's worth giving it a go. But then Jones looked Jones, very comfortable yeah. in the middle order in the true. first game, having true. struggled. It's true. They've, I think they've I, Danny messed White, that a lot. I'm not sure. Her big, a big issue is just is, is being in for being in for. 10 balls or so. Mm. I mean, I know, you know, again, we're not comparing apples with oranges with the men's game where we're saying go harder, go harder, go harder. In the women's game, they can give themselves a little bit of time to get in, you know. I don't, I don't see any issue with that. And when she, and she did that yesterday, um, played a couple of nice, you know, hit a nice, couple of nice firm strokes through the infield along the ground, got the pace of the pace of the game and then was unstoppable, really, you know. Mm. Pune Yadav could not get away with the 30 mile an hour lobs because she just kept running at her and twatting it, um, which was lovely. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, your, your moment of the week was from the first game of that series. Well, actually, two, I've got two moments of the week, if that's allowed. Is that yeah, going to allow it, me to do it, that? What a week. Um, <laughs> extraordinary. Well, one, one is because, again, it's, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit cheeky, um, is, is, is both involve India. One is Surrey employing Ashwin. Uh, to give him a net before the test series to get <laughs> six for twenty seven bowled out Somerset for seventy the other day, which I know will uh, will please England fans up and down the country. Well done the re we 've done it again um, <laughs> and uh, and then the next was was Harleen Diol's, um cat boundary catch the second one in and over Humphrey Cor took a beauty diving forward. I think that was to get rid of Siver and then Amy Jones was out in the same over Harman Precor with the gymnastics on the on the boundary edge um, and, and not necessarily for the catch. But because of the fact that it, it got myself and Charlie Dagnall's commentary on, on American television, which is not before time, um, to be honest <laughs> with you. So, <laughs> so all good. No, Iron that, up an NFL gig well, soon. Well, for sure. I mean, you know, you know what I'm like with data. Yeah. <laughs> Put on the Tonight Show. <laughs> I really enjoyed Catherine Bunt's send-off to, to Verm in the last game. It was just very funny. Um, just going back to the first game as well, I, just, I, I really enjoyed watching Siver back. Yeah. Because actually... Beaumont and White had struggled a bit. The pitch didn't look particularly easy to score runs on and she just looked like she was back on a completely different pitch. And I think she got the fastest ever 50 by an uh, England woman in T20I, 24 right, balls, yeah. I think. Yeah. And I'm not sure she played the same shot twice. I mean, all her boundaries were different and still beautiful in themselves. She's such a beautifully creative player when she gets going. And her numbers have improved massively over the last few years. But you still, when she plays like that, you think people shouldn't really be getting her out. I mm. mean, she just looks so, so good. Uh, she looks really comfortable at number three. I think it's probably taken too long to give her that responsibility and she's really uh, enjoying that. And and she seems to be enjoying the vice-captaincy as well. It's interesting. I, I suspect she might never be England captain. I'm not sure that would suit her that well, but I think the vice-captaincy seems to to really fit with her personality and that she doesn't want to be speaking all the time, but when she does speak, everyone listens. I don't think she'd fancy having to do all the press that Heather Knight does, but... That's, that partnership seems to work really well. Mm, she hits the ball unbelievably hard yeah. as well. I mean, twice as hard as the next as the next best in the England side. Christ. I mean, so I got a text message from my old teammate, David Ward, saying she hits the ball harder than you ever did. I said, you're damn right. Especially with those, especially after you used to steal my bats at when they arrived at the <laughs> Oval and I got left with the cast-offs. But he's right. She absolutely kills it. Yeah, it used to kind of feel boundary or block with her though, and she's so good at rotating the strike now. I think that's the thing that's kind of changed most about her game over the last year or two. Mm. Uh, moving on to the county championship, the group stage has come to an end. Yorkshire, Lancashire, Notts, Warwickshire, Somerset, and Hampshire are the six teams to qualify for Division One. Some really good games this round. Gloucester, Hampshire was was the big one in Group Two. A draw was enough 
For Gloucester to qualify, Hampshire needed the win. Hampshire were miles ahead of the game on day three, but a Tom Lace 100 for Gloucester on day four gave them hope for survival only for Hampshire to wrap the win late in the day. As Butch mentioned, Ashwin took uh, six for not many on his Surrey debut. Uh, could be his last game for Surrey at the Oval uh, in, in a game where Jack Leach also claimed a six for. Um, Kent had to field an entirely new team after the first team was forced to self-isolate. There were six first-class debuts, but they still managed to secure a draw against a very young Sussex side. Harry Finch, formerly of Sussex, scored 100 for Kent on the final day while wearing his old Sussex lid with a, with, a, with some tape hide, hiding the badge, touch, which is excellent. Um, Derbyshire Essex was abandoned after an unnamed Derbyshire player tested positive for COVID. The final day and a half of the Roses match was abandoned as well after 20-year-old seamer Dom Leach suffered a pretty grim knee injury colliding with the concrete foundations of the Western Terrace at Headingley. Uh, Yorkshire have since said, analysis has previously taken place and identified issues with a layer of thatch that can that can cause a build-up of water on the surface following heavy rainfall. We had originally planned to get the outfield relayed before this season, but unfortunately, difficulties arising due to the COVID-19 pandemic result in this being delayed. The club intend on completing this work at the end of the season. Slightly worrying because there's an England game scheduled there uh, this week and also a test match scheduled to take place later this summer. Um, Some news about the 100. There have been a few more big-name replacements. No worries. Um, some news about the 100 there been a f- there was a few big name pull outs no Pollard or Russell uh, due to A Guyana being on the red list and Pollard suffering an injury Wahab Riaz can't come over because of visa issues and Sune Luce in the women's tournament won't be travelling after she tested positive for COVID India media outlets by the way are also reporting that two India players have tested positive for COVID and are isolating at the moment um, a lot of COVID news um, until the other day you had England isolating Ken Derbyshire, a couple of India players. Um, but how, how worried should we be about the rest of the summer? Exceptionally worried. Um, you know, the, the, the great reopening is, is occurring on, on the 19th, no matter what. Um, cases are, are going up. Um, and if protocols are, are followed um, the way that they have been and the way that they, well, nothing has changed in terms of that. Then, you know, did I read something yesterday that the Nissan factory, they've got 700 workers off at the moment having to self-isolate because of, um, you know, pings happening to people in the in the factories. It's going to happen in cricket. Um, the Indian team won't be able to replace an entire side. 100 teams won't be able to replace an entire side. Um, it's going to be a miracle, frankly, if we get through to the end of the season with, it, with, with none of it being adversely affected and perhaps even uh, affected to the point of having to to cool things off. I mean, I think it's. I don't think that that's being alarmist to say that. Mm. Um, I think. I think if things don't change, there's real cause for concern. Mm. I think that the hope is that they come up with some kind of route around the system, maybe with some help from the government, maybe with some leeway elsewhere. If they, you know, they if they act early um, and and put the appropriate systems in place. But at the, at the moment, it, it, it's it's nerve wracking, isn't it? It's that horrible feeling of the last few days where it's gone from being like. Um, it'll probably is you know a bit worrying, but it'll probably pull, pull through. So now you're just suddenly seeing everything stack up. You're seeing the story, seeing the, you know mm-hmm. non cricket, you know bigger companies, bigger situate, bigger industries than cricket not being able to find a way around this kind of problem. I think that's the that's the worrying thing is mm. that it's kind of out of everyone's hands. This you know we're 18 months into this thing and we're still coming up with coming up against situations where you almost just have to shrug and go, you know what. What, what will be will be it's out of our hands it's this next month that I think is going to be the most difficult period because you've got Freedom Day um, in four days time cases are, are just going up basically in a straight line um, people are just going to have to isolate like hell it's going to be possibly that August the 16th thing comes in where people who've had two vaccinations don't have to self-isolate that might make things easier late in the season but I think it's going to be really difficult I mean the, the Royal London Cup that's that's probably going to go isn't it um you know with so many players having to isolate anyway uh you they'll probably and people won't like this but you'll you'll need backups available for the 100 basically for that so much money's been put in that competition i can't see that not happening yeah the one day cup is looking hugely precarious and uh county fans understandably furious that was the that was the kind of consolation prize without having any county championship cricket in the in the heart of the summer one day cup was going to be what they would retreat to to avoid the hundreds and you know it looks it looks unlikely that's going to happen as you say there is so much money invested in the hundred that it needs to happen whether you like the hundred or not it really needs to happen in some form 
Uh, same goes for the India series. Um, I mean, if if, if, all, if it all got called off, the financial implications for the ECB would be absolutely dire. Um, that is, I mean, we all want to watch cricket this summer, sure, but that that's mm. got a bit. Of, we all love cricket. That is the most concerning thing about mm. all of this. I mean, the the only reason the only reason that let's rewind the only reason that cricket was allowed to go ahead at all last summer was the fact that the fact that the, the teams were isolated. You know, they were kind of holed up in in hotels and um, you know that were part of the cricket grounds that they were playing the games in. Everybody was kept out. They were kept in, and that was how it all worked. Um, that hasn't been the case this summer. Hence. The Kent team gets gets wiped out. Hence, Derby's matches get wiped out, and you have to go on a percentage of uh, percentage of points in 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 their group in the championship. Um, you know, in the touring teams have all come over. They're all in general population in the hotels. Yes, there are you know the, there are protocols, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but it's nowhere near as stringent as it was. Um, and so, therefore, you're going to get cases. There is, I don't think, there's anything you can do about it. And they're also, and, they, and they're all, and they get, to, and they get tested. They have to be tested in order to be able to, to be able to turn up and go to work. And and therefore, therefore, there are going to be there are going to be neg- negative, positive. Depends on which way you look at it. <laughs> <laughs> Lowercase on <laughs> <Yeah>. the <laughs> And there are, be, there are going to be um, people who who are who are test positive for COVID. And it, but in addition to the to the bubble, the extra security we had last summer, the, there just weren't actually that many cases when cricket was going on last summer. That it it tailed off dramatically after the initial first wave. Whereas now it's everywhere. Everyone mm. knows someone who's either got it or is isolating. That the second even people with second jabs seem to be getting the Delta variant. Thankfully, they're not getting particularly ill that's the main thing obviously mm. but it does seem you, there are lots of cases of people getting testing positive mm. um so yeah it, it doesn't it doesn't look good at all the concern i think is that if you compare it to other things that have been called off other tournaments other series it's often been for optics reasons so like during the ipl there obviously there was issues with the kkr bubble um or kkr breaking the bubble but the main reason it was called off really was just that it felt so distasteful by the end of it because there was so much going on outside of the bubble, outside of the outside of the cricket being played. That's not the case this summer. The issue is going to be, can they literally play the games? I think that's what's more concerning for me is it's not, you know, especially with the financial element, to an extent, if it was desperate, they need, did need to play and it was only about the optics, then they could just bludgeon on and carry on and it would feel ropey and crap, but we'd, do, we'd get it done. The issue is it's, there could just be a day where it's like, we're, we're done. Mm. That's it. There's and, no one around. And, and also suddenly we, me and Joe are playing a test match. But we also, we also don't know really um, what the long-term effects of long COVID are. And that, has, that can have quite serious effects on, on the performance and, and the physicality of professional sportsmen. Um, Newcastle United, for example, in the Premier League season, they had quite a few players out with COVID. Some of them suspected long COVID and it had quite a long impact on them. And, Professor Sportsman won't want to get that. Sure. Um, I mean, re- we don't want to go down the science angle yeah. too much, but research does suggest that uh, if you've had double vaccination, then the chance of getting long COVID are significantly okay. reduced. So that is, again, a, a positive. That's, I need to stop using that yes. word. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the other, I suppose the other, yes. the, other thing, the other thing to consider is that, you know, again, these, these players on the road, you know, if, if England sort of left South Africa in the circ- under the circumstances that they did, which seems like a you know a lifetime ago now, you know you could the Indian players could be com- for, forgiven for thinking, well, hang on a second, what the hell are we doing going there? Mm. You know, I don't know what their vaccination status is. I don't know what. I think they've been jabbed. Haven't they? Yeah, they, they they've been, been done. Yeah. They've been double jabbed. Okay, think so. so maybe that maybe they're in a, in a position where they're not so not so worried about it. But I mean, I don't know. Mm. They, they, you put it this way, you you'd sort of forgive them for for saying, you know what. We're not coming. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're done with this. Yeah. Um, but we'll see. I mean, listen, I just, it, it, you almost you almost sort of hesitate to try and make any sort of call as to what's going to happen next because uh, but the only thing is the direction of travel. If you were on if you were on Winvis or whatever it was at the moment, you're following the you're following the algorithm. The algorithm is not looking particularly mm, happy. Christ. Yeah, I think we haven't got that problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, get get to it. Probably quite a bit richer if I did. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, we've, probably, we've soured the mood, yes. We need to, we need to yeah. up the energy. <laughs> the 100 starts in less than a week. Ah, there we go. Uh, which which seems that. really weird. Um, Joe, you spent a lot of time thinking about the tournament recently. You wrote a piece in the, in the upcoming magazine. Um, Freddie Wilde uh, asks, what would constitute a successful launch season for the 100? Uh, at this stage, some cricket. Yeah. <laughs> probably. <laughs> Completion. <laughs> I'm only being slightly <laughs> facetious. Yeah. Um, I think... 
I think it being acceptable, I, th- I think there are going to be lots of teething problems. I've been, the people I've spoken to, I'm surprised that given this was all meant to happen last year, I'm surprised there is still so much stuff up in the air. You speak to the players, they don't seem to know what's going on, they don't seem to understand the rules. I'm sure that will all change in the next week. Uh, and I think, I mean, you're aware of this, Yaz, as well, that the, there's likely to be timing issues. Like they've, they've sold this as all being done in two and a half hours. Uh, that's how it's sold as, in terms of tickets. That's how it's sold in terms of to broadcasters. That's important when it's not going to be on the BBC and you've got more restricted time. Uh, the pilot went way over that. Um, and when you've got a certain amount of adverts that have to be shown on, on Sky and you've got captains and players adjusting to the new rules, I think they're going to run into issues with that. And I think that could become a bit of a farce and it's going to be another stick with which to beat the 100 mm. as if there aren't enough out there already. Um, another thing that I object to, and this this is still kind of up in the air, we'll see how it plays out. But as I understand it from speaking to people at, um, uh, people involved in the broadcasting of the, of the tournament, there's going to be a kind of change of language involving bowlers. So, so when you say the score, you don't say 32 for one after five overs. You just say the score and the number of deliveries. Wickets, as I understand it, is not really a part of the dialogue in that sense. It will still be referred to if there's wickets falling regularly, but it's not it's not kind of on the tip of the tongue of the, the commentator. And then same with bowling figures. It won't be one for 20. It will be runs conceded off bowls, ball, bowls delivered. Now, for me, I think that's quite... That's massively underappreciating one fundamental aspect of the game. And we know watching T20 that actually it's the bowling sides, the better bowling sides that often win games. And how important wickets are in doing that. And how important wickets are in doing that. And I think there is a risk that actually you you end up making bowlers just kind of glorified bowling machines. And if this is all about getting the next generation on board... They they already think they are anyway. (laughs) Let alone alone just removing the the one currency that they have from the... the, uh, Exactly. So, yeah, if if this is all about the next generation getting people involved, who's going to want to be a bowler? Mm. If if your wickets barely get a mention, Mm. the the idea apparently is that... No, that's that's just just not true, is it? If you're you're Sakeem Mahmood and you're running in and you've just cleaned up... Quinton de Kock and the dot stumps, ball. the stumps, dot ball. stumps flying everywhere. He's gone off the, he's walked off the pitch. You're the star of the show. Are you really that bothered about whether or not Butcher said it to wicket? How many wickets you got? I think you're probably more bothered about what, you know, what's actually happening in the game. I, I mean, think I, I just, sorry, just really quickly, because it's, it needs to get off my chest. The, 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 is, the issue of the language is, and, you know, not using the word overs and things like that. I understand completely why it gets people's back up. It almost feels like it's designed to. It almost feels like it's a prod to try and, you know, get get a reaction out of people. What I would say is just call them overs or just say wickets. The broadcast is there to, you know, do you, do you, do what when I've come when I come to the oval, I don't call it the Kier oval. I don't I don't go you don't no, adhere you don't adhere about to the, the official it's about the new language. audience. It's about what the new audience Well then they won't sold. mind. No, if it's meant to be, the idea is it's meant to be some kind of gateway. Yeah. And if the language is sufficiently different, and I would say overs is a pretty fundamental part of the game, that is quite a jump. In the same, if the scoreboard is going to be counting down in the second innings, these things are going to look very different to people who are experiencing the game for the first time. As Dan Norcross said in my piece, we don't want these fans presumably just to, to switch off cricket and then turn back onto it next July when the 100 starts again. They go and watch a county championship game or a test match. Everything looks different. Everything sounds different. And I think I'm... I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm pro the 100. I'm definitely open-minded to it. But I do think there are certain things that have just been unnecessarily complicated. And it I, seems I to me like there are lots of people sitting in a room who don't really know much about cricket who are making these decisions. And I that, that frustrates me. Yeah. I think, I think what, I, what I would say as well, I think that what, what annoyed me this week when, ev- when everyone saw the playing conditions and, and responded, you know, as, as if when the blast, com- the blast playing conditions come out, everyone sits there and scrutinizes every detail and gets very, very angry about everything. I think what annoyed me is it's not, the rules aren't complicated. The language, maybe, as you say, maybe I'm underestimating that. Maybe there is more of an issue there. But the rules aren't complicated. Mm. It's a T20 game, but it's five ball overs. And if you want, you can bowl two overs in a row. Mm. There you go. There's no, a game. I, I agree. That. A, that 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 should be the strap line. That should be everywhere. Like the, the, in, in terms of just putting it forward, making it clear to people. Yeah, I completely agree. But from from a, from a nerdy cricket point of view, I think the one playing regulation that I thought was weird was the one uh, that ensured there has to be a fifty second break between the change events. So when when you're punishing sides uh, for having a slow over rate but also blocking them from actually sprinting between ends. Yeah. That is strange. Mm. That is, is, that, is, that not to, is that not to regulate it so it's consistent? That's for broadcasters. For broadcasters. I mean, did, broadcasters did, did, I can't remember if we mentioned this last week, but again, there, there was an occasion during the match yesterday, uh, during the, the women's game yesterday, whereby um, same bowler, middle of an over, but 
a different a change attack something happened during the middle of that over and so Nat Siver ran a good you know 130 yards to, to be in the optimum fielding position for one player to be in the optimum mm. fielding position for another and you know the game stopped for a while and I'm sort of sitting there thinking this, this is going to happen this happens this is a built in thing for every 10 balls that you're going to get not only are you going to have field changes and captains wanting to have their field, their best fielders in the, in the optimum places for certain players, but this is actually going to happen whilst the end is still going mm. because you go from, you know, presumably you go from leg spinner to, to, to quick bowler or whatever, and suddenly everybody on the field moves, but you don't have the natural break in between overs to which to move. It all happens while everyone's staying in the same place. I think that was quite an issue at the trial. And that's, that's, yeah, and, and, and so, so you have two issues there. One is... One is that that's going to take time. That's built in, that that's going to take time. Two is, is that the players aren't going, to, aren't going to instinctively know what to do. You know what I mean? You lose that, you, that, that energy. The players are not instinctively going to know what to do. They're going to have to know what the captain's thinking in terms of who's going to be bowling the next set of five in order to have some kind of an idea in their heads as to where they might be asked to go. But all of that is going to require communication every single time. Yeah. And that's going to take time. It's yeah. going to take even when even when people start to understand what's going on. That is not something that happens. And so what happens? So what you get is you get everybody standing still, but lots of people moving, and no cricket happening. Yeah, which right? is a, which is an issue. So at, at least in a change of overs, everyone go okay. That's six ball. Everyone kind of switches off for a bit. You have your chat with your mate, get your sandwiches out or whatever, and everybody moves and runs around. But what you're going to have is this this sort of strange uh, strange situation whereby. The game is supposed to still be going on. Everybody's standing still, and yet nobody's playing like, playing the game yet. Yeah, optic. It, it, it's it's an Op- odd, it's, it's an weird. odd it's an odd image. It's really I, really odd. I think yeah. I think you're you're, you're both completely right in terms of it, there's gonna it's gonna take time. I think for the for the rhythm of the game to establish itself, and the, the final is gonna look very different to the first game in terms of the players recognizing what to do. That instinct that instinct kicking in, so you know, okay, right, we're gonna go here, da da da. And and I think that'll happen in the broadcast as well in terms of the rhythm. I mean, you know what it's like when you you know end of the over, score and a pause, and then ha- you go to the break. To, and having that's... to hold up a card in order to signify when when somebody is changing something. So that's so that's a white. Card. So again, apparently you know, in the pilot they used a red card for that, <laughs> which seems <laughs> inexplicably stupid. Everyone that's knows a what a red card is. Like, <laughs> Off you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but again, you know, you kind of like you have you're waiting on a you're waiting on a signal for something that didn't require a signal before. It was just the end of the over and yeah, everybody moved. Exactly. You know, I'm surprised that they've gone with it. I'm surprised they've gone with a card rather than just another umpire sim- 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 oh, They've run out of signals. Well, exactly. Maybe that, they've just like we've done that swirls. Was genuinely, we've done a- that was genuinely the the justification. Oh really? The, yeah. They can't ask the, the umpires to do anything more. Yeah, there are too many too many signals. I mean, fair um, play. I mean, you know, if, if I was an angry person on Twitter, I'd say, why don't they get the umpire to dab yeah. or something or do do the floss? We're 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 focusing quite a lot on on the like the, the changes in the regulations and to, to, to what we're used to seeing but um how how we how excited are we for the tournament itself I, i'm actually quite excited for it if, if it goes ahead uh, and all that i think like number one um i know ben we've talked about this before the blast is impossible to follow and a lot of people have argued that uh, you should have had a a tweaked blast tweaked blast i, I don't really think you could have done it. people have suggested a two division blast but i think that could have just exacerbated the, the, the financial differences that you already have, we just end up with pretty much the test playing grounds. I mean, look at the county championship. You've got five test playing grounds and Somerset in Division 1. People talk um, about the idea that, oh, you, you know, the Blast's going to become a second tier tournament. I'll mm. tell you what, I'll make it a second tier tournament. You make it two tiers. Yeah. The second division <laughs> of the Blast is going to, would be, you know, really low quality and no one would watch it. Mm. That's, the, that's the main issue with that. And, and the Blast is, is, it's really good when you watch the games, but yeah. it's impossible to follow. Um, and I think this is also going to be just condensing the talent pool is just going to lead even without the massive overseas stars is going to be great cricket to watch. I think I the think chain, be really exciting. That's, also, that's, all, that's always been that's always been the argument to, to doing something something smaller to something with, mm. with eight teams. Always for my for, and that's made always made perfect sense to me. And, and the also, argument the argument was never you know, 20 overs itself is, is needs changing. It was just kind yeah. of like, well, how do we do it so that everybody, so that all of it is significant? And that's, so I, anyway, I mean, the, look, I, I don't want to get into this because it's kind of, it's been <laughs> how many years, um, I, you know, they've come up with an idea. I'm morbidly curious about how it goes. I'm going to be working on it. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit terrified about working on it, to be honest with you. I think we all I would be. We all are of, a bit. <laughs> because of, you know, because of the amount of unlearning that's going to have to go ahead and things, again, that you know, commentary and, and, and calling games and whatever is instinctive or it's meant to be. 
Hmm. And, of and course, it's best, it's, it's instinctive. It, yeah. well, absolutely. People are so, going to have to be prepared to be patient, so you, and I'm just not convinced there is going to be a huge amount of patience well, I mean, out there. It's not so, what we're used to, generally. Twitter's and it's going to be fun. <laughs> so the, the, issue, the issue is is obviously that in order, because, because people have had so long to kind of get used to the idea, so long to get riled up against it, that unless it's perfect from the get-go, mm. no one's going to give it a chance. And that's mm. the, there is the issue that, that, that the whole thing has. The one thing I would... The, the, the fundamental thing that Butch touched on there and it is that... And I've said, it, I've said it since ball one, ball one of 100, is that the, the most important thing about the new competition is the format of the teams rather than the format of the match itself. That's the thing that makes it good, is the fact that it's eight teams, it's condensed, it's a tournament that you can follow. These T20 leagues around the world are fantastic to watch. They're really entertaining. It's really good cricket. Up and down at times, like any form of sport, but they are brilliant to follow. They're exciting. And people get into them in a casual way because it's one game a day. You follow it. There's a narrative to it over a short period of time. Like you say, the Blast doesn't offer those casual storylines. It's a great great tournament in its own way. Lots of lots of positives. The vast player base has been shown shown to be a good thing in the current series, in the series that's just gone. There's, no, there's lots of good things about the Blast, but casually following it is, is not one of them. What needs to happen for the 100 to be to be a success, if we're going back to Fred's question about, you know, for it to be a successful launch season, is that we have two or three moments across the, across the, seri- across the tournament where everyone is just hooked into it. Mm. And we have a Johnny Bear still 100 in the first week, or we have a Jason Roy 100, or Saqib takes a five foot, or Jofra comes back from early from injury and manages to kind of, you know, claw a game back for the brave, or Tim R. Mills becomes, a, you know, a national star, or someone who... Is, is unearthed who's been great in the blast for years someone like Lewis Gregory again someone who's a brilliant T20 player but no one ever watches him play T20 cricket bang him on telly everyone's watching of an evening you get those water cooler moments and that that's I think you need you only need a handful of those to make it a successful season and then next year the cricket's going to be even better because they'll have better players in hopefully they sort out a West Indies uh, international window so the Windies players can come over and play for the whole thing and and it, and it goes from there it grows I think that's the thing is, they need expectations to be managed managed in, because it's because of the issues that they've got with COVID, because of the issues they have with scheduling and players dropping out. Mm. A success, and, 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 a success and, and, and for they, this they, year is yeah. do people watch it? That's it. Yeah. Uh, do the numbers are the numbers that, that that come through, particularly on the BBC? Because I can't. Again, I'm not sure, but I can't imagine that Sky subscriptions are going to go through the roof for people tuning in exclusively for the hundred. And, and frankly, why would they when you can you can watch bits of it on for free on the Beep? So are <laughs> are the numbers of people watching it do they start at a decent number and do they grow throughout the tournament if that happens then i suppose it's it, then i suppose you can constitute a success because actually nothing else really matters are people interested in watching it if they are it's a success if they're not it's not hmm. that's it it'll be it'll be good it will be good if it goes ahead and we don't have mass dropouts and it goes as it should then the cricket that we see will be really good in a truly shocking development uh, from the Birmingham in-house DJ, the Edge Pass in-house DJ, told me they're not going to be playing Sweet Caroline at any any of the games. Good, good. To be fair, please I've, very, I've very much had my fill of Sweet Caroline. <laughs> when, they, when, they, when they played that during the third ODI, I was like, it's too soon, way too soon. <laughs> um, Joe, there's a new Wizarding Cricket Monthly out today. What's, what's in it? Well, my 100 preview, uh, which includes six players to watch, two of which have already pulled out. But there's lots of other, <laughs> there's lots of other good stuff in there as well. Um, pretty much all the stuff we just talked about. Uh, but in a bit more detail, um, my favourite piece in there is by Suresh Menon, who's our Indian correspondent, uh, former editor of Wisdom India. He's a fantastic writer and, and he's written a piece for us on the kind of lineage of Indian batsmanship. Uh, the different schools of Indian batting, where they've come from, how they've morphed. Um, the journey from Gavaskar to, to Kohli to Pant. Um, and he's done it very beautifully. I learnt lots, which is always always nice when an article comes in and I read lots of stuff that I didn't already know. Um, so I'd highly recommend that. Um, he's also doing, um, he's preparing a piece for our next issue, which is which I think should be really interesting, which is how Indian cricket perceives English cricket uh, historically <laughs> and now and how that's changed over the kind of the shifting of... of um, power in in world cricket and England's involvement in the IPL uh, and again I don't really know what the answer to that is so I'm looking forward to reading that but back to this month what else have we got there I wrote some notes because I always immediately forget what's in there yeah, there's um, a great quote from Jeffrey Boycott about himself <laughs> <laughs> sounds about right <laughs> so we asked Jeffrey Boycott so our, our the final uh, entry in our county series where we've gone through every every one of the 18 counties and asked someone 
prominent from that county to pick their greatest 11. So we asked Jeffrey to, to pick his Yorkshire 11. Uh, and as he said, my way to run and speak for themselves. So he's, <laughs> <laughs> so, Fair play. He's opening the batting. Boycott Hutton's, gonna boycott. Hutton's shifted down to number three. Um, but, you know, he's right. His way to run and speak yeah. for themselves. Uh, so that's quite fun. Uh, quite a few good lines in there, as you would expect. Um, we've got an interview of Elise Perry that Taha did um, on her kind of celebrity and a kind of tricky time in her career for, for a player who's just barely put a foot wrong since she came through. Um, we've got Ben Jones here. Oh, uh, yeah. His golden summer on, on Bell's Ashes, as it as it should be known. Uh, and Ben re-falling in love with, with cricket. That's that the way you put it, wasn't it? Rediscovering cricket. Yeah, fell in love in 2005 and then discovered other things as a teenager and then was like, actually, this cricket thing is quite good. And now Ian Bell's <laughs> a just familiar glo- journey for a lot of us. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So that was, yeah, that was my, my, second, my second marriage, basically. Um, <laughs> and then the cover story is, and we've touched on this quite a bit over the last few weeks in, on the pod, is, is a kind of special investigation into English uh, cricket's red ball batting crisis. Why aren't batsmen scoring as many runs as they used to? against the Red Bull, um, looking at all the different reasons behind that, whether it's county cricket, whether it's changing techniques, whether it's T20's emergence. We've lent quite heavily on Butch's dad, Alan, who uh, knows more about batting than, well, certainly the three of us and probably Absolutely. probably you too. Is that fair? <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, he's, he's given us some excellent lines. There's some really good stuff in there. We've spoken to a couple of county batsmen about just how hard it is to score runs on, on county pitches. They tend to focus on the scheduling as the main reason for for struggling um, rather than the pitches, although there's a bit of that as well. So that's got there's three essays basically um, investigating that. I can't pretend we found a definitive answer. That wasn't really the aim of the thing, but there's certainly lots of lots of interesting points in there. Um, and what else have we got? We've got Andy Zaltzman uh, picking out the significance of the number 46 over about a thousand words, which is just <laughs> beautifully done as ever. Dan Norcross picks out his his favourite spell. Uh, which is his uh, his and Stuart Broad's formative summer as Test Match Sofa got going before he he uh, switched to the BBC, obviously, in later years. Is that 2009? Or? Yeah. 2009, yeah. And a really important piece in the club section, which is by Scott Oliver, which is kind of in response to what happens with Christian Eriksen at the Euros, um, about the importance of having defibrillators at cricket clubs and a couple of stories of people who have survived as a result of defibrillators being used, a couple of instances where they haven't and probably would have done if there was one fitted. Uh, it's not something I'd thought about in any detail at all, but if you uh, play for play club cricket or certainly if you run a club or have a um, kind of proper role at a club, it's definitely worth reading and thinking about because, you know, this is actual life and death stuff. Mm. This is stuff that actually matters as opposed to all the rest of it. Um, so yeah some some high points some laughs some some serious <laughs> stuff there's everything in there so go and get yourself a copy excellent head to wisdom.com forward slash shop to get your copy um, moving on Joe your moment of the week yeah a uh, another magnificent moment for Irish cricket um, who beat South Africa in the second ODI at Malahide the third one is happening tomorrow I so, so yeah, you, yeah that, that series will be decided might be decided by the time you listen to this. They're actually, they're quite unlucky in the first one. They're going pretty well. They were well set at 195 for four with 10 overs to go in the first game. Then the rain came down and called it off. But in the second game, they made two, 290 up for five. Andrew Balberni scored 100. Uh, 79 from 20-year-old Harry Tector. And a quick fire 45 from the reinvented George Dockrell. Left arm spinner <laughs> turned mid-lord a power hitter. Yeah. Uh, Amazing. And South Africa were well short in the end, I think by about 50 runs. First time Ireland have ever beaten them in, a, in an ODI. Um, another significant moment, but I actually I interviewed Paul Sterling for the latest issue. And uh, the thing that struck me most was how much he misses county cricket. He, he would love to still be playing for Middlesex, but mm. he would have to do that as an overseas player. Got to go for a win. <laughs> <'Cause> otherwise, accidents. <laughs> Not editing that bit out. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just he's, continue, right? Yeah, he's been making faces for the last five minutes. Bless him. He's moving. He's moving. I was like, if, if you just, if you got if you got to go, just go. But yeah. <laughs> anyway, where do I start? Uh, uh, Harry Tector. Harry Tector. Harry Tector. Harry Tector scoring uh, seventy nine. Twenty one year old Harry Tector playing a pivotal innings. Uh, George Doctorill in his reinvented role as a middle order power hitter, scoring forty five from twenty odd balls. Um, and then South Africa didn't get especially close. Ireland win the match, their first ODI victory over South Africa. Um, and yeah, I spoke to Paul Sterling for the latest issue of the magazine in which he said 
first of all, how hard it is for these young Irish players coming through. He he learned his trade playing county cricket and playing a lot of the so-called lesser nations in international cricket. And he failed loads and that was fine and he'd have the odd success. Whereas these players, and it's a good thing, but it's a, it's a tough thing as well. They're learning their game against Rabada in ODI cricket as part of this World Cup Super League now. Uh, and if they can w- get wins like this, it is so good for the, for the future of Irish cricket. And Sterling said they can't celebrate these individ- individual victories. It has to be about stringing together performance after performance. And they're in fifth position in the Super League, top seven plus India qualifiers. So they're in decent shape for that, despite having lost to the Netherlands quite recently. Um, so yeah, I think it was probably an unexpected win. South Africa doing some odd things with their side. Quinton de Kock being rested for the first two. Uh, when he's about to play the 100 shortly, all being well, um, which seems an odd thing to do when you look at South Africa's batting depth or lack of it, uh, you would think you'd want to cock in that side. And mm. I'm, I'd expect he'll play the third one, which obviously changes the dynamic of that team quite quite strongly. But yeah, a, a, another, another kind of successful chapter for Irish cricket. Uh, and we're starting to see a few more of them again with, with this kind of young emerging side playing alongside players like Sterling and at Valverne and and starting to look like quite a decent team again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a couple of other interesting stories from Minsash Cricket in the last week. Bangladesh beat Zimbabwe in a one-off test there. There was one crazy incident where... Um, uh, Butch, you're, you're going to want to hear this, actually. We're, we're on Bangladesh-Zimbabwe. Um, oh, Strapping. So, first of all, Mamadullah in his last test match scored 150 and put on the second highest ninth wicket partnership in the history of test cricket with Taskin. Um, th- there was a there was a very strange incident when um, Taskin, when he was batting, um, like blocked a ball and then danced to celebrate that he blocked the ball again off Musrabani, and then Musrabani wasn't very happy about this, and they have like a head to head face off where like Musrabani pushes his head against. Um, Taskin's helmet, which would probably get you a red card in football. Um, they both got fined. Fi- no, <laughs> crucially. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, he, 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 they both of them lost 15% of their match fee. Um, but then later in the game, Mujibani hit a four off Taskin and then did the same dance move back, which oh, is lovely. quite entertaining. Um, but yeah, Bangladesh won that test. And in, in, in the Caribbean at the moment, West Indies at the time recording a three one up against Australia. Um, Mitch Marsh has turned into Sobers. He's got three half centuries in the series. In the most recent game, the one Australia won, he scored 75 and took three for 24, um, which is quite intending. And also, uh, because re- if, you, if you go back by recent results, Ireland are, are better than everyone, basically, because uh, South Africa beat West Indies in the T20 series. West Indies are beating Australia at the moment, and Ireland are beating South Africa at the moment, which obviously means that Ireland are better than all of them. Mm. Follow logic, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm yeah. with you. Yeah, with you. Um, just just on, on on Marsh, that is actually quite a big thing because um, with it looking quite unlikely that Steve Smith's going to be playing in the World Cup, yeah, um, they need to find a number three. And Mitch Marsh getting promoted, you know, it's not been a very good tour for Australia so far, um, but he's a clear and obvious positive. So yeah. Uh, so why is Steve Smith not going to play in the World Cup? Just uh, injury. Uh, well, he's an injury concern, and he's um, obviously managing himself ahead of the Ashes. Yeah, just, okay. Um, Ahead of his inevitable 800 run summer. Yes. Um, yeah. so. Is he is he a great loss? In, I, in a T20 scene? No, not at all. No, no, I, I, I kind I, of feel I, like he get he gets picked bases on the basis of being a very good 50 over batsman and unbelievable Test batsman. Right? Without wish, without wishing to to make this longer than than, uh, than, than Yazel <laughs> wants it to be, um, I think there, there there was a, a style of cricket that Australia were playing which was very bowler heavy, and so I think if you've got Ash, someone like Ashton Agar at seven. Then having Smith in your top three is no bad thing because it just you know you just go a bit more conservative. Mm. But I don't think it's the best use of Australia's resources. So I think actually it might be a blessing in disguise and push them in the, in a direction which will make them a better side. I still th- I, I think there's a really good side to be made out of Australia's uh, T20 group, but at the moment they don't have it. So it might mm. it might be the catalyst for for improving. Interesting. Um, finally, we have a fantasy game. Uh, a brand new game for the 100, both the men's and the women's comp. It's called the Cricket Draft, powered by Wisdom. And we've created a league for, for our listeners and, and our pundits on the pod. Um, the links for both leagues will be in in our in our pod description and on Twitter after this goes out. So it's very, very easy to set up. So um, yeah, get, get, get involved. Um, it's, it should be good fun. Um, quickly, hang on, I'm going to read out my team. Um, and we see, Go on, 
<laughs> my team, my team at the moment is is best. O- in the, the, my men's team is best. O'Clark, Duckett, Hales, Moeen, Captain, Livingston, Vice Captain, Decock, Parkinson, Linter, um, Rashi, Khan, and Reese Topley. I knew you'd Beat pick that. Jake Linton. Yeah, it's, 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 it's quite cheap. It's it quite cheap. And a good bowler. And a good bowler. I'm going to read my um, team out as well because I think yeah. it's be- I think it's better. Uh, <laughs> Best Oak Phillips, Salt, Lynn, Jax, Livingston, Decock as captain because uh, he's nice and rested after the ODIs, and then Saqib, Timar Mills, Lockie Ferguson, and Adil Rashid. And yeah, it's quite gun good. Side. I've, I've got Phillips on my bench. Um, I've got Smead on my bench. I think he's going to be good. Uh, Brooke on my bench and Will Jacks on the bench as well. So I've got. A strong squad, good group of players. Good um, ethos, yeah. good, good, good energy around <laughs> the place. Fantastic yeah. environment. I don't think we're taking this too seriously, yes. <laughs> Do you want my team or are we bored it, of that go now? For it, go for it, Okay. Uh, Salt, Conway, Banton, Hales, Captain, Livingston, Vice Captain, Sam Curran, Phillips, Mahmood, Garton, Parkinson, Ferguson. Good team. But you done yours yet? No. No, cool. Right. Anyway, well, this... one, th- one, one, thing, one thing I would say, one thing I would say is I, I didn't spend quite as long uh, on this as I would have liked to. But that's probably for the best because it's the kind of thing that I could very easily spend the day on. So, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, well, that is all for today. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, but this has been the Wisdom Cricket Weekly podcast. If you enjoyed the show, tell your friends, and we'll be back next week. Cheers.